Morning, it's evening. <laughs> um, we've been just chatting for a few minutes, but thank you all for joining on live stream and for those here. We will begin with a word of prayer and then we will jump right into the study of God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word and I thank you for how powerful it is and for the power it has to change lives. I pray that as we focus on the topic of prayer this evening, that we would really consider our prayer lives and that we would really consider areas in our life that we might need to consider growing in and just just changing because we really want to see you work we really want to see you change our nation we really want to see um lord you do a great my work that you we know you can and i just pray that you would use this message today in jesus name amen at the end we will um have a, a prayer, time of prayer uh we'll do it the way we did last week, if that's all right with you guys, to pair up and and close out that way. But um, that being said, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Maybe you are familiar with this section of the Bible, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to move this down a little bit. I feel a little bit loud. Um, but the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus's um, teachings that is there is he's speaking to a great multitude and um, this is during Jesus's year of popularity. So this is a very important um, these are very important three messages and I don't know this this is a lot of teaching. You can definitely do a series and spend several months on just the teachings of Jesus from these three chapters. Chapter 5 is the Beatitudes. Chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. And chapter 7 includes the Golden Rule. Uh, I was surprised when I was a teenager to find that, um, or actually I believe I was in college when I found out that the Golden Rule isn't just a general good rule, but it's actually in the Bible. And that was really uh, eye-opening for me. But in Matthew Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches about prayer. And let's begin. We'll read verses 1 all the way down, reading until verse number um, until verse number 15. Matthew chapter 6, verses verses verses. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, beginning in verse 5, not in verse number 1. The Bible says, And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly." But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to stop there in verse 13. And this passage is all about prayer, and Jesus teaches us how to pray. What I found very interesting, if you like, you could come on in, brother. Um, what I found very interesting about this is that Jesus mentions this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, two different times in two different um, passages of Scripture. There is Matthew chapter 6, and there is Luke chapter 11. And in Matthew chapter 6, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus teaches the multitudes, the crowds, how to pray. And, and certainly, that is something that the multitudes and crowds ought to know. Everybody ought to know how to pray to God. But in, in, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus Christ finishes praying and his disciples had just been watching him pray. They had just seen Jesus pray and they were amazed by Jesus' prayers. I don't know what Jesus' prayer life 
would have been like, but knowing that he's God, it was probably pretty impressive. He probably was humble. He probably was not arrogant. He probably knew what he was praying for and is, was just an amazing example. And, there, and they, those disciples, in that awestruck moment, seeing Jesus pray, asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And these, this multitude, they, they didn't have the chance to ask Jesus to teach them to pray. But what's interesting is that the Sermon on the Mount is before the other story, which means that Jesus taught them how to pray from the Sermon on the Mount, and the disciples were there. And then later, when they realized that they didn't know how to pray, they saw Jesus praying. They were amazed by it. Jesus repeats his instructions. He tells them what to pray for and how to pray. Now, by now, you have, I don't know how many years you have been saved or how far along the Christian life, but if you will oblige me for um, the sake uh, this evening, if you'd like to raise your hand or just uh, say it out loud, um, you probably know what prayer is, but what is prayer? What would you say if someone asked you, well, what, what do you mean prayer? What does that mean? What would you say? What is prayer? Would anyone like to share? It's talking to God. That is exactly correct. Prayer is speaking or talking to God. What else is prayer? What, it, what, it, what is the purpose of prayer? Or what else is prayer? What would you guys say? I, I, um, when, I was, when I teach the teenagers, I, I pick out specific people. But, but besides talking to God, what would you say prayer is, Mr. Phil? Prayer is fellowship with God. You enter into a personal fellowship and witness with God just a one-on-one basis. There you go. That's, that's very good. It's, it's fellowship. It's building a relationship. Um, I wrote also, prayer is asking God for things. It, it, it can be bringing requests or sharing what's on your heart, but ultimately it boils down to talking to God and having fellowship with God. And we know what kind of things to ask or pray for, uh, pray, praying for specific needs, etc. But if you're like me, um, you might not be. You might be more of an extrovert than I am. I struggle with communication. Uh, you say that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, you, you, you preach all the time. But the truth is that I tend to be more of an introvert. I don't necessarily like being the center of, of conversations or the center of attention. And I don't necessarily always enjoy conver conversing, etc. And that becomes an issue sometimes with Harmony. Um, I, Harmony wants to talk and I'm not always... Um, I'm not always wanting to talk. I don't always want to have a deep conversation or, or whatever. And maybe you know what that's like. Maybe you can relate. But um, in order to have a relationship, there has to be communication. Now, now, God has given us his word, and he speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through experiences. He tries to teach us things. He speaks to us sometimes through messages. God speaks to us in various different ways, but it, the way we respond is through prayer. That's how we talk to God. And we want to ask ourselves, how is my relationship with the Lord doing? Am I growing in grace? That is our theme this year, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when it comes to our prayer life, when it comes to our relationship with the Lord and talking to God, how is that going? Jesus, or before I get there, um, I just, I just like to ask, a Christian should pray because it's how we talk to God and it's because it's how he can answer our prayer requests. And um, the question or the reason for this message is, do you want to talk to God? Do you want to ask him to answer your prayer requests? The only way to, for that to happen is to pray. And if you don't pray, the question would be, well, why not? And I would like to ask, just go around, what could be a reason somebody would give for not praying? In other words, I don't pray because of this. What would you say, Mrs. Winger, if you had to say? Interrupted schedule. Certainly. And and that is that's something I wrote down that when our schedule when we do not plan it or whenever our schedule interrupts, I think that is that is a very real thing. Um, what could be another reason that we don't pray or that somebody would give I don't pray because of this? What would you say, Mr. Bob? is a reason somebody would give not to pray. They're not comfortable with it. 
They're not comfortable with it. That's, that's exactly, some people feel embarrassed or nervous. Uh, even if they're just praying by themselves, it is weird or awkward. Um, would anyone else like to share a reason why they think somebody would, would not pray? You could say that either disbelief or lack of faith. You know, some people believe either you know, God doesn't hear them or God's not going to answer it or you know, why would God answer it? That is exactly correct. Wow, that's, that's very good. That some, they, they have a lack of faith in God that he's hearing or that he can that he will or can answer that is that is very true and um, and a, for for a lot of those those are reasons sometimes we struggle with praying and uh, some re- people give the reason that they don't know how they say well I've never done it before I'm a new Christian or even if they're not a new Christian they've never really delved into it um, some people it's it's similar to what you said, Brother Phil, is that they don't want to. And that would not quite be true if you're a saved believer. Because as a saved believer, your soul desires, your, who you are, does want to do what's right, and it does want to pray. So when we think we don't want to, that's our flesh speaking, and it's not telling us the truth. Um, and, and what Brother Bob said, I wrote down as far as it's weird. Well, when I was eight or nine years old, my mom taught me how to clean the bathroom for the first time. She said, it's about time you learn how to clean the bathroom and, and help take the load off of your older siblings. So I, uh, my mom showed me the cleaning supplies and she taught me how to scrub down the sink. And if we're real, uh, cleaning the bathroom is not a difficult endeavor. It's not hard to do. It's not hard to figure out. But as an eight or nine year old, I really didn't want to clean the bathroom. So I really didn't do a very good job. And when my mom said, well, you, this, is, this is still dirty, I would say, well, I don't know how. Well, my mom still, she, my mom took the time to show me how. And I just didn't want to, but eventually I, I began doing that. Eventually she taught me how to clean the shower. She taught me how to clean the shower and same thing. I was lazy. I didn't want to add that to my plate of responsibilities. Hey, hey, my uh, sister Kim, hey, she can do that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to have any part of that. But uh, so I would say I don't know how. And when we can come to prayer, we could come with the attitude that we don't know how. But the truth is it is not in, in, incredibly difficult. And Jesus actually guides us to how. And the, it's, it's not so much about can we learn how, it's about will we, it's about do we want to. And Jesus, in this passage, answers some questions about prayer. He answers uh, and he, he responds to some, some of those excuses that we give for not praying. And we want to dive into those and learn uh, how to pray, how not to pray, and what to pray for. So let's dive right in. The Bible says in verse number five, the Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Now the hypocrites is referring to the scribes and Pharisees, the religious rulers. The Bible says that the hypocrites, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. The purpose uh, for their prayers is to get people's attention, to draw people's attention to themselves. That is why they pray. I don't know if you have ever been in a prayer group where somebody just waxes eloquent in prayer. They just, they just talk um, and talk and talk and they just, they just sound so spiritual. And when we have to be very careful, especially in a group setting of prayer, that when we're praying, we are not praying so that other people are impressed or look at us and think that we are so spiritual, but that we are truly praying to God. You see, lots of people pray. We don't want to pray incorrectly, and we certainly don't want to be hypocrites. They, uh, the purpose of prayer, as we said at the beginning, is to pray to God and bring our requests to him, whether those requests are difficult scenarios or we're going through uh, 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 health needs of people we know, etc. We could go on and on about what specific prayer needs we have, but if we come to God with those prayer requests to talk to God and our purpose is to get other people's attention, that you can't do both. You can't both seek other people's attention and respect and also be praying to God. It's, it's really, the prayer to God is meaningless. The Bible says this 
about, about those that pray, standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets. They do that so that they may be seen of men. The Bible says, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. As Christians, we understand that when we pray to God, we want God to answer those prayer requests. We want to have fellowship and, and communion with God. But if we are doing it for attention, that won't happen. The opposite will happen, that we get exactly what we were going for, which is people's attention. Now, I don't know if you see this in the, in the verse. Can you imagine uh, Pastor Kuntz or myself standing on the corner of Washington and State Street, just wearing a robe, hands up in the air, just, just praying to God and just doing that for several hours. That would be pretty ridiculous, wouldn't it? Uh, most people that would pass by on State Street that see us with our hands up in the air would say, what are those guys doing? They look really weird. And um, they probably wouldn't be impressed by that. They would probably think, what a bunch of weirdos over there. But um, there could be some that would say, oh, wow, that, those guys are really hardcore Christians. Those guys really love God. Well, it's not about the outward. It's not about other people being impressed by what we do or say. It's about uh, speaking to God. The Bible tells us, do not do that, but instead, he says, when thou prayest, verse 6, enter into thy closet. Now, you have a closet at home, and um, unless you're playing hide-and-seek, you probably don't go into it. Or if you go into it, you go into it, grab your clothes that you're going to wear for the day, and, and that's it. But Jesus, in this passage, says, go into your closet to pray. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that when you pray to God, you don't have to be in public. You don't have to be in a major group of people. You can just go by yourself, off alone somewhere in solitude, and pray to God. That is, that is the goal. That is the focus. Uh, the, it's not to get the respect and admiration of others. It is, to, it is to talk to God and bring requests to Him. Now, the Bible says, And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now we see the reward of praying for people's respect or attention, or, or doing anything really for people's respect or attention, that they get what they're going for. Okay, If you're going for getting people's respect or attention, that's what you get. But if you come to God seeking Him, seeking a relationship with him, seeking to grow in your prayer life, then the Bible says that thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. God openly and obviously blesses those prayer requests. The second instruction of what not to do, Jesus says in verse number 7, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. I think it's very interesting that Jesus specifically says, as the heathen do. Now, what is a vain repetition? Well, maybe you're familiar with repetitions like, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, amen. And before meals, sometimes like the kids just say that little chant. Or um, what my grandpa said with me a couple times was, Lord, I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now, now that prayer is almost asking God to save you every time that you go to bed. But the point is that it is a vain repetition. It is just repeating the words. Now, um, for, for me and Harmony, I have to be careful when I pray for food, for meal, and ask the Lord's blessing. I say, dear Jesus, please bless this food of my body. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, and, and it can just be words. It can just be what we do, what we say. It could just be a vain repetition. Uh, another example is that Catholics pray the rosary. They pray Hail Mary several times over and over. They include the Lord's Prayer in this, but their minds are, are somewhere else. Why is that? Because their words, they're just being repetitive. They're just saying the same thing over and over again. It, uh, that doesn't work in a conversation. If I just said, hi, Mr. Phil, hi, Mr. Phil, hi, Mr. Phil, hi, Mr. Phil, we'd say, what is wrong with you, Tim? 
Why, why can't you just be normal and just have a normal conversation? But the fact is that the heathen do this, and as Christians, we can be, um, we could, we have to be careful not to pray using vain repetitions. Now, now there is a difference between praying a prayer request and a repetitive prayer. Now, uh, some people have prayer requests for people to get saved, and they pray for those prayer requests over and over again because they really do care about that person accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior, or somebody that is sick, and they repeat that prayer request. Repeating a prayer request is not the same thing as a repetitive prayer, but the idea in this verse, the Bible says, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. They think the more I say Hail Mary or the more I say the rosary, that God will answer the, the, my prayer request. God will hear my prayer more if I say more prayers. And it's not about the quantity of prayer. It's about the quality of prayer. It is about consistently coming before God. Now, when it comes to prayer, I wanted to say in the introduction that sometimes, um, sometimes my struggle with prayer is that I am not necessarily very structured with it. What, what do I mean by that? Well, um, I do not necessarily have a point in time every single morning or day that I pray. I pray bullet prayers when I'm in the car or when I'm thinking about something. I, I pray often, but I do not have a specific time set aside. So that is, that is something I, I can be transparent as far as what my struggle is with that. But Jesus says, do not use vain repetitions. The Bible says in verse 8, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. That's found in, in 1 Peter 5, 7. And the idea is that the reason why we should come to God and share prayer requests with him is because God cares about you. He loves you. He cares about what's on your heart. He cares about what you're going through. He, and he also knows what you're going through. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows your heart. He knows what you've been going through. He knows exactly what prayer requests you're about to pray. He knows exactly what you're trying to communicate. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit helps. He, 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 kind of, uh, 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 he, he kind of sorts those prayers out. But when we pray to God, sometimes we're overwhelmed. Sometimes we're going through a really difficult time. And when we pray to God, it can, uh, it can be difficult to even speak. It can be even difficult to share what's on your heart. But God already knows. I don't know if this is making sense. Here's, here's a picture of this. Whenever I tell a story, sometimes I'll miss a major detail. Has that ever happened to you guys? Where you missed a major detail of the story? And so the person who's listening was like, that story doesn't make any sense because you just left out a major part of that story. Um, and so you go back and you explain that one major part. Well, if you leave out a major part when you're telling God about one of your prayer requests, God already knows the, the missing part. He know, you don't have to say everything perfectly to God. God cares more about your heart and, than, than the perfection of your approach. And God wants you to come to him. He definitely wants you to pray to him. Now, uh, in youth group and at our church, we pray before starting services Wednesday and Sunday. That's the first thing we do. And those prayers can become habit or just routine. They be can become repetitive. The, the real question would be, well, why do we pray when we start? Is that just because we're supposed to do or what we always do? But the idea is that when we pray, we're not just doing it out of a vain repetition or to impress other people, but because we're praying to God, because we want to bring our requests to him. Now, like I said, prayers don't have to be perfect, and you don't have to say everything correctly. That being said, the question becomes, what are we supposed to pray for? First question was how, how not to pray or how to pray, in a sense, but the second question would be how not to pray. I considered bringing a, um, I considered bringing a whiteboard up and drawing this out. But maybe if you can just picture in your mind with me for a moment, uh, you will be able to see this. The, the Bible says, what are we supposed to pray for? Verse number, ten, verse number 9, after this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, 
hallowed or hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means holy. Now, in the Old Testament, the, there was what was called the holy place, where was, uh, with, which had the Ark of the Covenant. It had the holy of holies. And the temple, there, if you can picture a big rectangle, there was a court for women. That was where the women could go, and, 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 um, and they could not go to the men's court. So there was the court for the women, there was the men's court, there was the priest's court, and there was the holy of holies, now the, or the holy place. And the holy place was divided in half by a veil, and, and on the other side was the, um, uh, there, it was divided by a veil. So once a year, the high priest would bring a sacrifice to pour onto the Ark of the Covenant And that would only happen once a year, that they would come before God. Now, they often did sacrifices, but only once a year would the holy, uh, the high priest come before God. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the Bible says that the veil was ripped in two, which signifies that for us as believers, as saved Christians, that we have access to God that we can come before God. And the Bible says that after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our God that we worship, that we believe in, is a holy God. He is pure, righteous, and holy. He is so holy. And we, as, as Christians, we can come before a holy God. What an incredible privilege of prayer that we have access to God, that we can talk to Him, and that we can bring our requests to Him. That is amazing. The first point is to pray. um, If I can, uh, I, I apologize. The first point is to pray to God, address God, to reverence and respect God. Acknowledge who God is, that He is holy. And it's important for us to recognize that we're actually praying to God, that He is listening to us. And, uh, and we've covered the, the illustration there. Now, the second prayer request would be for God's kingdom to come. Now, we understand that the kingdom will happen after the tribulation. There's going to be the rapture, the tribulation, and then the kingdom. But pray for the kingdom of co- to come through Jesus will return to bring saved believers to heaven, and that could happen before we die. That would be the rapture. And after the rapture is the tribulation, but we anticipate and look forward to the Lord's return. We pray for it to be soon, for God's will to be done. You see, God has a plan. He has a plan for every person. He has a plan for this earth. And uh, we want to pray for God's will to be done. The, the Bible says that God's will is for everyone to be saved. And many of you, when we pray and when we share prayer requests, you've mentioned names. You've mentioned family members, friends that are lost, that need to accept Jesus Christ as, as their Savior. The Bible says in verse number 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And it is God's will that lost people would accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is God's will. And, and that is something that as Christians we ought to pray for. We ought to pray for the lost to be saved. And we ought to pray for the saved to do what God has planned for them. The Bible says, give us this day our daily bread in verse number 11. And I found this prayer request very interesting. I thought, when was the last time that I prayed to have something to eat? You say, well, we pray before we eat, but but you, you understand what I'm saying that there are millions in and, and, and nations across the world that do not know if they're going to eat today. They don't know if they're going to have another meal. They are so hungry. And the Bible says to pray, give us this day our daily bread. God has been very good to us. God takes care of us. He provides for our needs. And we ought to seriously thank Him for that. We have enough money in America. We can go out to eat when we want to. 
We could go and get um, better food than they've had uh, in all of human history, just, just as much as they have improved it and improved it. And what, what am I saying? I'm just saying that God's been good to us. And we ought to thank God for His goodness and for His provision for us. God provides for the birds. God takes care of them. And God provides for our needs. And when we have needs, when we are going through a little bit of a, a dry spell, if you will, where we're struggling, we, are, um, we have needs that are not being met, we ought to pray for the Lord to help, us, to help provide those for us, that for our daily needs. Now, like, like I said, the birds don't worry about where they're going to get their next meal or, or, or anything. They, they don't worry about those things. We can, um, like, we, we've covered this point, but the, the fifth letter is to um, forgive us our debts. And when I look at the word debts, when I looked at this, it, be, it, it confused me. Is God saying just uh, that we would like abandon all of our debts that we have? But what it is actually saying is forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our sins. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we do wrong, we pray to Jesus for forgiveness. Um, if you are here and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, Jesus Christ forgave every sin that you've ever committed, past, present, and future. But when we sin after accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior, sin is a wedge. Sin separates us from God. Sin harms that relationship. Sin can keep you from the Bible. The, uh, there's a saying, uh, sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. And there's also that when you are in sin, that it will separate you from God. You will not want to come to God. You won't pray. Things like that. And when we do wrong, we come to God and get it right. We confess those sins, not to be forgiven again in the sense that to have our sins forgiven so that we can go to heaven. We don't need to get saved again. If you're saved once, once saved, always saved. But if you sin afterwards, then that is the purpose of this verse, to confess our sins, is to clear up that relationship. And God wants us to have a relationship with him, but sin uh, makes it impossible. Now, the Bible says for, in verse number 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The, the principle is to help us to forgive other people for their sins when they do wrong things against us. And uh, when, when, it, when people do wrong things against you, it can be really difficult to forgive them to let it go, to, to overlook it, or to, not, or to let go of the bitterness that maybe you feel toward them. Um, but God says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 32, I'm going I'm to turn there and we'll read that together. The Bible says in Ephesians, I cannot turn there, um, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 32, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. The, the foundation or purpose for forgiveness or reason for it is because Jesus Christ has forgiven you. So we want to forgive other people that they've done wrong to us. Now, uh, we're going to turn back to Matthew, and we're going to finish this passage up. Um, there are two, two points left. The letter G, or the seventh prayer request that we are to pray for as believers, uh, is to pray for, um, is to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Bible teaches that God does not tempt us. He does not uh, entice us to sin. But the principle is that when we go through temptations or when we go through trials, difficulties, that we are, the Bible says to pray that we wouldn't go through those things. 
I found that very interesting as I was studying for this message, that God says, uh, don't lead us into temptation. Sometimes we could think, oh, wow, the people who go through the most intense trials are the most spiritual. And there are certainly examples of people who have gone through incredibly difficult situations and have really responded in the correct way and turned to God in spite of whatever they were going through or whatever happened. And the, uh, but, but Jesus says, pray that we wouldn't have to go into those trials. Pray that we wouldn't have to. Now, trials, we understand trials do ma- make us better and stronger, but Jesus at, er, says to pray that we wouldn't experience those difficult trials. He uses those things for good, especially trials. Sometimes he tests us like, we, like he tested Abraham, and many of you have been through probably more tests and more difficult tests than I have been through yet. Yet, the Bible, he asks that we would pray that we wouldn't experience those trials. I think that's very interesting. The Bible says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, When it says deliver us from evil, what I found in my study, this is saying deliver us from the evil one. This is saying delivering us from Satan. Um, the context seems to indicate that Jesus is referring to Satan. And we know, we understand that Satan hates us. He hates everything about the Lord. He wants the worst for you. He wants the worst for me. And he's like a roaring lion trying to devour us, the Bible teaches. And you can pray to God to help you overcome Satan. God can deliver you from his attacks, from his deceit and lies and tricks. Now, We've discovered what God says not to do with prayer. We've discovered what the Bible says about how to pray. And these verses are very powerful verses. I challenge you, uh, maybe take some time tonight, read these verses through again, what Jesus says about how to pray and how not to pray. But like I said at the very beginning, the disciples didn't get it when they heard it the first time. They were in a Sermon on the Mount, and that sermon had so much content. Um, Somebody told me on Sunday that, you know, that was a good message, but you just had a lot of content. I I preached for 50 minutes, and uh, that's a long time to preach for. But um, I, I, I preached a lot of content, and Jesus preached a lot of content here, but when it came to the prayer, their own prayer life, they didn't really take advantage of it. And so they asked Jesus later when they saw him in his impressive prayer life, they thought, wow, I want that. Well, is it going to take, see, somebody who has an impressive prayer life to learn how to pray, or are we going to take advantage of the opportunity to learn? I want to challenge you to do the latter because I believe that will help you as you grow in grace. Let's go ahead and bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today's message. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for Jesus Christ, for his wisdom, for the way he taught us to pray. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to do what you've said to do and to not do it in the incorrect way that we can have tendencies of. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to have faith, believing that you can answer the prayer requests that we have and that we would take advantage of the opportunity we have to come to you, to come to a holy God in prayer. We love you, Savior, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, I would like to give opportunity if anyone would like to share a prayer request. Um, would anybody be willing to help me shut off the live stream at this moment? Um, oh, thank you, Brother Phil. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, we'll say good night, goodbye, guys, and um, we will see you guys on Sunday. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> But be thinking if there's a prayer request that you would like to share, um, we would like to share those and pray for them if possible. Um, you, uh, on OBS, have you done this before, Brother Phil? No, it's, it's off. I'm just reading. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I wasn't sure if... Um, all right. But um, does anybody have any prayer requests that they would like to share, that they'd like us to pray for? Yeah, uh, Ten years ago, at the church I was at in Buffalo, 